hi and welcome to my channel explain my name is ek and in this video i want to talk to you about sources on medieval scotland please note that this video does contain a discussion of racism no matter when or from where, history is kind of teased out from a variety of sources. Archaeological finds, architectural monuments and buildings, art that has adorned the walls of caves and palaces alike. Documentary evidence is often considered kind of the bedrock of historiography, uh, particularly of the last two millennia. This is not necessarily for the good. Prioritising written sources over non-written has overwhelmingly and often deliberately diminished societies and cultures that utilise other means of communication, uh, of preservation, of cultural transmission, usually non-white, non-Western cultures and communities. The sources I'm going to outline here are documentary and Scottish historiography has relied on them to kind of create an understanding of Scotland's history that we have today, uh, an understanding that is constantly in flux and rightly contested. But I do want to note that documentary sources are not the be all and end all. Uh, written sources are are not inherently more valuable than any other type of source and in any era or place non-written sources are almost always uh, available and should be considered as important as the written and written sources just as non-written sources have utilities and limitations and it is our task as historians to draw out these limitations and hopefully turn them to our advantage they should never be taken at face value and the secret is to read against the grain um which if you have kind of done any formal academic study of history you've probably had that saying a million times and begrudged that it's actually quite useful because you're sick of hearing it um essentially reading against the grain is to look at what the source is not telling you and seeing if that might be of any use some of the sources i'm going to talk about today are unfortunately unavailable uh, without some kind of academic uh, or institutional login to like a library. I believe that all universities should begin offering uh, access to their online resources for like a small annual fee uh, to the public but some of these are available in modern translations that you can either find online or um, like pick up at your local bookshop. I shall endeavour to put in the description any of the sources that are more readily available. My focus of study is the late medieval period in Scotland, that generally means up to 1560, which was the year of the Reformation Parliament, and also the year that the Catholic regent, Marie de Guise, who is Mary the Queen of Scots' mother, died. Um, so people think that's kind of like this shift from the medieval to early modern. Um, some argue more for 1513 and the Battle of Flodden and the death of James IV. Um, but I think, you know, within and without Scotland, a periodisation is a fickle beast. And I think we just need to be a little bit more flexible because it's made up. We made up periodization, but that's around for another day. Uh, I keep talking about these sources that I'm going to talk about, so I better get on and talk about them. We are going to begin with Chronicles. Medieval people loved a good chronicle. These were essentially works of history, the documentation of historical events, usually written by scholarly types who were almost invariably associated with the church, because at this point in Scottish history, only those destined for the church had a kind of university education, even kings and um, princes and princesses uh, would have been educated within their household. These texts, these chronicles, were usually compiled through research, not necessarily the type of research which university professors would accept today. These texts weren't supposed to be kind of accurate necessarily. They were not intended as these kind of scientific narratives that could be proven to kind of today's standards. And um, these works often and unapologetically had other priorities. And if we can tease out those agendas and kind of like the underlying implicit messages within the text, we can gain far more from them than if we simply read them at face value. We will start with the big daddy, Walter Bower's Scottish Chronicon. Bower was born around 1385 and served as the abbot of Inchcombe between 1418 and his death in 1445. Inchcombe is on an island in the Firth of Forth uh, that looks incredibly fucking cold and wet. In fact, I was gifted a guidebook by my best friend who visited the abbey and the book is a little bit worse for wear and like a little bit soggy because it rained the whole time. Inchcombe was established in the 12th century and became an abbey in the 13th. The Scottish Chronicle, which is deceptively difficult to spell, the trick is thinking it as like Scott-i-Chronicon, 
I've had to write about it. I think in several, several um, I don't know if I wrote about it in two essays or just the one. But once I found it, it really was like once I've learned to spell Scott Chronicon, it's over for you hoes. And it was. Bower's work outlines events in Scottish history between the reign of Malcolm III, who was the wife of, no, who was, mm, Christ. Bower's work outlines events in Scottish history between the reign of Malcolm III, who was the husband of St Margaret of Scotland in the mid 11th century, and the beginning of the reign of James II in the mid 15th century. Bower tells us about lots of incidents, for example, Robert II's death in April of 1390, who Bower describes as, quote, the peacemaker, the son of peace, and the burning of Elgin Cathedral by Robert's son, the Wolf of Badenoch, uh, in June of that same year. Bower also tells us that prior to this, Elgin had been considered, quote, an ornament to the whole country. In 1391, Bower tells us of a William de Douglas of, of In 1391, Bower tells us, a William de Douglas of Nithsdale was on crusade in Northern Europe when he was, quote, treacherously killed by Englishmen after a very bizarre back and forth incident where Douglas was challenged to a duel by an English noble named Thomas Clifford, who was the sixth Baron Clifford. I really couldn't make head nor tails of it, to be honest. Like, they, they had some, like, beef, and then Clifford was like, let's, like, let's fight it out. And your man Douglas was like, okay. And then Douglas was like, I need to go and get some better weapons. So he nipped her. I think they were in like Poland or something on crusade. And he was like, just, I need to, I just got to run back and get something, like get some more weapons. And then Clifford had heard that he had fucked off and was like, oh, he's, he's like running away. Um, and I'm not really sure what happened then. Douglas gets back to Poland and a bunch of Englishmen are like, we're gonna kill you. And they did. So one of the things, it's very, it's given Romeo and Juliet in that all of this could have been prevented with better lines of communication. Like this would never happen if you have WhatsApp. We also hear from Bauer about the impact of successive plagues and famines in the mid 14th century. Scotland's experience of the Black Death in the 1340s, late 1340s, is kind of, it's, I don't know if it's necessarily unknown, like there are definitely, I imagine there's loads of specialists who'll be like, I know exactly about the impact, but generally there is less kind of evidence about it as in England and in other parts of the world. And some of what we think might have happened in Scotland is based on extrapolating stuff that happened in England and being like, it was probably somewhat the same, but we don't know. But Bauer says he knows. He mentions it that in 1349, there was, quote, a great pestilence and mortality that ranged over a wide area during many earlier and later years throughout the whole world. Presumably he's talking about the Black Death. Now, if you'll recall, I said that Bauer was born around 1385. So how did he know about these things, these events that took place prior to his existence or when he was a child? Wow, the same way that I know about things prior to my existence or when I was a child, through research. The Scottish Chronicon builds in part on the work of John of Fordun, a 14th century priest who wrote several chronicles, including the Chronica Gentis Scotorum, which begins with the mythic beginnings of Scotland under the daughter of a pharaoh. Fordun is a bit mysterious. We don't know as much about his life as we do Bower, and some of what we do know is only because Bower told us. Bower said his predecessor, to quote Fordun's biographer, was, quote, an undistinguished priest, not of a product of any of the schools, which means he probably didn't have a university education. It's also pretty savage. Uh, that's not a quote from Bauer. That's a quote from uh, the biographer who was like, Bauer kind of said this. But either way, whether it's the biographer or Bauer, somebody is dragging this man for filth. Bauer kind of ascribes to Fordun the motivation of compiling records of Scottish history, which may have been lost or destroyed during the Wars of Independence, uh, which were like at the turn of the 14th century. And Edward I uh, of England, definitely had like not necessarily a scorched earth policy um but like a scorched ideology policy I don't I don't really know how to describe it but he deliberately removed Scottish symbols of kind of identity and nationhood uh like the stone of Schoon or stone of destiny as it's sometimes called um which I talked about in my video about the places I had visited in 2022 um and also St Margaret's Black Rood which is a bit of the Holy Cross 
and that was said to have been brought by St Margaret from question mark could have been Eastern Europe could have been Hungary where she was born could have been England who knows she picked it up on like a service station when she was on her road trip and next they went by boat maybe the boat had duty free when she was going to Scotland Bowers kind of role in his relationship with Fordan very much reminds me of how some writers after their death have their work kind of continued or completed uh, so Christopher Tolkien for example published some of his father's like unfinished works um, and remained kind of an authority on his father's uh, world. So Bauer was kind of like assembling and tidying up and then continuing uh, with Forden's project, or at least Forden's kind of attitude towards the project of chronicling. However, Bauer, of course, added his own content, drew on other sources from the preceding centuries and put his own spin on things. And his version was pretty nationalist, for example, he adds materials on St Margaret of Scotland that were not present in Forden's account. He places her very firmly as a dynastic figurehead and a champion of Scotland's independence. Okay, I do, I think I do explain it a bit later, but basically uh, St Margaret of Scotland was the Queen Consort of Malcolm III of Scotland and she was like the... Look, what is this? How is this even comfy for you? Yeah, but she was basically like the ancestor of um, the Scottish kings and royal line, wasn't she? Yes, she was. He includes a story from 1263, which had been written down by the monks at Dunfermline, um, which is the site where Margaret's remains remained. In this story, Margaret's spectre appears to a knight at Dunfermline just before the Battle of Largs uh, between Scotland and Norway. And she assures the knight of a Scottish victory and this prophetic spectre was correct and the monks wrote down that like oh there was a big storm and it washed the Norwegian fleet away. Bauer goes a little bit further though and specifically credits Margaret for this storm, for this victory. He writes that quote, by the will of God and through the merits of St Margaret, the Queen and Protectress of the realm and Scotland, on the very day of the battle a most severe gale arose on the sea. The scholar Kate Ash kind of doubles down on this uh, interpretation, writing that this inclusion of the kind of Battle of Largs occurs in quote, a part of the Scottish Chronicon that seems particularly concerned with Scottish heritage, monarchical descent and the assertion of sovereignty in the lead up to the Wars of Independence that began in the late 13th century. So she is essentially saying that Bower's work very, you know, explicitly is tying Margaret the idea of Scottish independence. Bauer gives an account of the Battle of Falkirk in 1298 uh, which was fought between the forces of Edward I of England and those of Sir William Wallace. Wallace's men end up fleeing the battlefield after which Robert the Bruce uh, makes an appearance and at this point is siding with Edward and the English. Robert asks Wallace uh, kind of who has inspired him. He says who, quote, drove him to such arrogance as to seek so rashly to fight in opposition to the exalted power of the King of England and of the more powerful section of Scotland. Wallace replies that, quote, it is your inactivity and womanish cowardice that spur me to set authority free in your native land. So, and according to Bauer, this made Bruce change his allegiance and end up fighting the English, though Wallace was dead by that point and had been chopped into four things and sent to four different corners of the realm. So how can we best interpret these very much nationalist passages in his text that proclaimed Scotland's independence and championed its patron saint? Well, it helps to know that Bauer was a political figure as well as a churchman. He was active in the reign of James I of Scotland and he wrote his text in the 1440s after James I was assassinated, but while his successor, James II, was on the throne but still a child. We can consider this work as a how-to guide for the young king as part of this genre called Specular Principum, which literally means mirror for princes. This is an incredibly popular genre of this time, I'm going to talk about it again several times in this video. It was kind of a way for people who were involved in some way in the kind of royal court and the political life of Scotland to offer advice to their monarch or sometimes to kind of castigate their monarch um, in an, an accepted way. Based on Bauer as a political figure using this genre, we can perhaps assume that the account of the battle at Falkirk was encouraging the king to listen to his loyal subjects 
just as Robert the Bruce was influenced by the words of Wallace. Bower's inclusion of St Margaret, the ancestress and kind of matriarch of the Stuart dynasty, and James II's ten times great grandmother uh, reflects Bower's kind of loyalty and devotion to the royal line and perhaps an emphasis on kind of sacred monarchy that might seem natural for a cleric in the company of kings. The Scots were not the only ones writing of Scotland. Contrary to what some may believe, travel of various distances was possible in the medieval period both within and without Europe and Scotland was no different. People travelled for trade, for work of all types, for pilgrimage and for war. These two latter kind of reasons um, account for a, a, a really enormous uh, swathe of medieval travel, particularly outside of the aristocracy. There are two accounts from travellers to Scotland that I want to look at. The first arguably is kind of a chronicle written by the writer Jean Frossard of Hanau, a territory in Europe that is now uh, like halfway between or on the border of Belgium and France, like it's been split into those two countries. Jean visited Scotland in 1365 and spent time with David II, the son of Robert the Bruce, and Jean's subsequent account of his time in Scotland was written around 1385 after speaking with various uh, Scots who were on the continent. So while Jean did have a kind of first-hand experience of both Scotland and Scots, uh, he was writing well after his visit. His experience of Scotland and Scots is not overwhelmingly positive. Uh, he writes of French soldiers stationed in Scotland who are bemused by the quote hard living. Uh, Jean says that food is scarce and everything, even leather, has to be imported in. He calls the Scots quote savages, rude and worthless, and claims that they resented the French troops who were currently stationed there. Jean kind of ascribes quotations to them such as quote what devil has brought them here? We are sufficiently numerous in Scotland to fight our own quarrels and we do not want their company. This hostility to the French troops, it might be understandable because when Frossard visited in 1365, it was less than a decade after David II had been released from English captivity at the cost of an enormous ransom. And the reason David was in captivity in England was because of the French. He had invaded England to support his French allies and lost at the Battle of Neville's Cross. And in 1385, when Jean was writing, France and Scotland were in the midst of another military campaign against England, which had been met with another failure. To assess Jean's angle, it might help to know that he was a close friend of the Queen of England, Philippa of Hanau, who was uh, his countrywoman. Thus, we might assume that there was a pro-English bias and Jean is definitely not flattering in his description of Scotland but that doesn't mean it's all lies forever and ever. Jean's work may have echoed a kind of general opinion of Scotland in medieval Europe. The Declaration of Arbroath, which I'm going to talk about shortly, describes quote poor little Scotland seeking recognition of its independence. So it may be that like Europeans just weren't a big fan of Scotland. Moreover, some of Jean's comments on the Scots actually echoed uh, the sentiment of John of Fordun um, in his discussion of the Scottish nation, particularly those in the Highlands. He writes that, quote, the Highlanders and people of the islands are a savage and untamed nation, comely in person but unsightly in dress and exceedingly cruel. He does allow that they are, quote, faithful and obedient to their king and country and easily made to submit to laws if properly governed. Interestingly, Fordun actually cites the third century historian Gaius Julius Salinus and his description of Scotland of old who kind of characterised Scots as bloodthirsty and brutal um, claiming that after a fight they could be found quote drinking the blood of the slain. So my point here is that you know Frossart was kind of a dick about it possibly because he was like besties with the Queen of England but that doesn't mean that everything he wrote was necessarily lies and you can kind of investigate whether other writers felt similarly the second travel account worth looking at is by rather an unlikely source. Uh, he was born Aeneas Silvio Bartolomeo Piccolomini, usually Latinized as Aeneas Silvius, but he is known more to history as Pope Pius II. Um, prior to his election to the Holy See, he was a papal legate, and it was in this capacity that he visited Scotland in the 1430s and spent time at the court of James I. 
a lot of his description is very like matter of fact um some is accurate for example that scotland is located quote on the remotest part of that island in which england is situated and that in the depths of winter quote the sun illuminates the earth little more than three hours which i think me and anybody who's been to scotland in the winter can attest to but he also records that scotland quote possesses no large rivers and is separated from england by a mountain which isn't really true um though i like sylvia's probably believed what he um was saying was true he'd probably heard it from people that he did you know didn't think they would lie i don't think this was like somebody sat down and was like oh the papal legate is here time to tell lies about our country it's just you know misinformation his wildest assertion and probably my favorite is this quote I had previously heard that there was a tree in Scotland that growing on the banks of rivers produced fruits in the form of geese which as they approached ripeness dropped off of their own accord some on the ground and some into the water that those which fell on the ground rotted but that those submerged in the water immediately assumed life and swam about under the water and flew into the air with feathers and wings Silvius is, understandably, most disappointed to find that locals simply reported this tree as somewhere vaguely further away, perhaps the Orkney Islands. This probably sounds very, very bizarre, but it does fit in with this sort of medieval European sense of like wonder and mystery about the edges of their world that obviously Scotland was at this point. So Silvius, like Frossard, is generally unimpressed with a medieval Scotland. And um, these travel accounts do offer us a lot of information, not solely in their kind of matter of fact details, some of which are of uncertain veracity, but in the perspectives of these foreign visitors both from their personal experiences and perhaps the kind of general reputation of the country. Now to a genre of source that is as popular in Scotland today as it was then. You know, English people are obsessed with Diana and Scottish people are obsessed with poetry. I'm going to talk about three different poets and their works. They all have political significance, but two of them are about the Wars of Independence and one of them is not. So I'm going to start with him, which is William Dunbar, whose birth and death dates are given as 1460 question mark. And then his date of death was somewhere between 1513 and 1530. Concrete details on Dunbar's early life are not particularly forthcoming and many seeking a biographical picture of his life before the court have relied on very creative interpretations of his poetry. But his time at the court of James IV of Scotland and his queen Margaret Tudor is far better documented. Dunbar was well paid for his efforts. Uh, he received various pensions and payments throughout his life that went towards for example, fine clothing. His poems on the royal couple, in my view, kind of represent the contemporary rationale behind the monarchy. Some of his poems follow that kind of mirror for princes genre in, in, in advising James, the uh, 1503 The Thistle and the Rose. It's a dream vision and very clearly Margaret is kind of this rose, but the, the lion in it, who is supposed to be James, is shown giving being given kind of advice it's not just like oh you're amazing it's giving it's saying like this is what a king should be like he has to be really fierce but he has to like be just as well dunbar also offers poems that just kind of celebrate their roles uh for the nation for example margaret's ceremonial entry into aberdeen in 1511 references several times the annunciation and the birth of christ margaret's role as consort of course was to secure the Stuart line by producing an heir so this is his advice to uh the queen and kind of his expectations of the royal couple and the monarchy more generally. Dunbar wrote a lot of poems, uh, almost all of it is in Middle Scots, the collection that I read, um, but it has the, it had translations of like this specific vocabulary, kind of like in school when you read Shakespeare and you have like the, the lines and then it's kind of explaining, uh, translating like little words and stuff. Um, so it was pretty like easy to read um, and to get to grips with and it was, you know, nice poetry I guess. Um, he also wrote a horrible racist poem called Of Anne Blackmore, um, which was likely describing Ellen Moore, who was one of potentially up to seven 
African members of the Scottish Royal Court at the beginning of the 16th century. Ellen's presence at the court is documented through treasury accounts uh, in 1511 and possibly up to 1527 under an item marked for Helenor, um, which could be Elena or Ellen. The spelling didn't really exist, okay? Going slightly further back than Dunbar, we have John Barber and Blind Harry, who both wrote about the Wars of Independence. I'm going to do a full video on this period in Scottish history soon-ish, but for now. In 1286, Alexander III died. His only heir was his granddaughter, who was an infant from Norway, but needs must, so the Scottish noble said, come on over to this infant princess from Norway. Um, but she died on the trip, and various contenders uh, with various royal ancestry came forward. To avoid civil war, the Scots asked Edward I to help decide, so he chose John Balliol, who became his kind of puppet king. Opposition first coalesced around a knight called William Wallace, um, and then after Wallace's brutal execution, Robert the Bruce, who was the seventh Lord of Annandale, who had previously been on Edward's side, uh, decided fuck this, had himself crowned king, and spent the next many years fighting to get the English to fuck off. Both Wallace and Bruce have since enjoyed near mythic status despite the attempts of one Mel Gibson and I do maintain that Bruce is one of one of kind of like the the founders you know these uh kind of foundation myths that different places have I kind of think he deserves his reputation in some ways so but like I said I'm going to be doing a video on that soon I have just done a video talking about the events in Scotland from the 11th century right up to the eve of the wars of independence um so this is coming next but have that to kind of whet your appetite Hi and welcome to the unplanned interval in this motion picture. I took a break yesterday halfway through filming to have something to eat and when I came back all of my camera batteries had kind of gone on strike I guess and as I would never cross a picket line I acquiesced to their demands. I don't know what I don't know what their demand the analogy is on its course but basically um, we're on day two of filming and I can be bothered to try and do like continuity blah 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 and try and make my makeup and etc so let's just let's get on with the matter at hand which is John Barber. John Barber wrote his work The Bruce sometime in the 1370s. Uh, it's quite epic, it has around 13,000 lines and it details Robert the Bruce's life from 1286 uh, with the death of Alexander III to 1314 with his incredible victory at the Battle of Bannockburn. I have zero interest in military history, I mention this constantly on my Instagram and sometimes I get people yelling at me and by people it's mainly men yelling at me because I don't care about like tanks. However, if I had to pick a battle to be interested in, it would be the Battle of Bannockburn. I don't know why, like I don't know why I go so hard for Robert the Bruce, uh, but there we are, so don't judge me. Um, but you know who else goes hard for Bruce? John Barber. This is unsurprising. Barber's patron was almost certainly Robert II, who had succeeded to the throne in 1371. He was Robert the Bruce's grandson uh, through Bruce's daughter, Marjorie Stewart, and the poem is almost like hagiographal uh, in its veneration of Bruce. Barber's Bruce is, quote, emblematic of the realm he leads. That's a quote, I think, from one of my textbooks. Um, and the poem kind of repeatedly emphasises uh, like identifies Bruce's cause as that of Scotland's and this cause Barbara tells us again and again is the cause of freedom. At the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314 where Robert's forces um, who until then had kind of enjoyed most of their success uh, using like guerrilla tactics to maximise uh, the potential of their small and sometimes scattered army. Um, but in Barber's account of this battle, Bruce gives uh, his army, who are vastly outnumbered by the English forces, the choice to fight or flee. Naturally, they decide the former, but this kind of feature suggests that Bruce was ruling through consent. In his speech, he mostly uses like you and we rather than I, and emphasises freedom ex explicitly, declaring that the Scottish army fights for, quote, for our lives and for our children and for our wives and for our freedom and for our land. Bruce inspires loyalty. He fights fiercely against all odds, 
um, he shows wisdom and is portrayed as kind of an unfailing champion of Scottish independence. Barber kind of downplays then the less coherently nationalistic elements uh, of Bruce's career because of course Bruce did fight on England's side for several years. Moreover, just before Bruce had himself crowned uh, at Schoon in 1306, which was kind of an explicit uh, act of rebellion against English rule, he was saying, you know, I'm the king, they can get fucked. Um, but yeah, so just prior to him being crowned, he met up with uh, like a rival for the throne called John Common in a church in Perth. No, Dumfries, a church in Dumfries. I always get it confused because James I was assassinated at a church or a uh, friary in Perth and John Common, spoiler, was assassinated in this church at Dumfries um, and nobody knows really what happened but Bruce and John Common went into this church and only Bruce was alive after after that happened so you know the man was not a saint but the source gives us more than these kind of like carefully selected details about Bruce's life it shows us the opinion of the ruling dynasty Barber is writing to suit his king, Robert II, and this is evidently how the king felt the story of his grandfather should be told. Moreover, the qualities that Barber kind of assigns to Bruce, regardless of whether they were true or not, are the qualities, evidently, in my view, that the Scottish politic desired in their ruler. It's yet another kind of mirror for princes, genre. Barber is not entirely responsible for kind of the modern, very popular assessment of Bruce, but I think he helped. However, not all poems dealing with the Wars of Independence eulogised Bruce like this. A poet who goes by the name of Blind Harry also produced an epic, later titled The Acts and Deeds of the Illustrious and Valiant Champion Sir William Wallace, but usually known simply as Wallace. He's a bit of a mysterious creature. He was born around 1440, uh, and died in or after 1492. Uh, his work, Wallace, was probably completed in the 1470s, so a century after Barber, and he actually took some of kind of the incidents and the structure from Barber's poem and also from Bower's Scott Chronicle. Harry did receive some payments from the Royal Treasury at various points in his life, but his patron was seemingly not the monarch, and while his work does fit in that Mirror for Princes genre, he is far more critical of his monarch who was James III, and he uses the character of Robert the Bruce as a proxy for James III so that he can be, you know, a lot more critical of his king through this kind of uh, indirect manner. This hostility to James III might be personal. James, at this point, was seeking an alliance with England, which was certainly not popular amongst many Scots, but it probably also reflects his audience. Blind Harry was writing for or in close proximity to Sir James Liddell of Halkeston, uh, who was a knight attached to the household of Alexander Stuart, the Duke of Albany, who was James III's younger brother. Apparently Albany couldn't stomach this kind of Anglo-Scottish amity, um, in part because his strength was mainly in the Scottish borders and beefing with England was, to quote Albany's biographer, Roland Tanner, a long-standing border way of life. So if we kind of look at Bower, who offered constructive feedback to his monarch, at Dunbar, who celebrated the regality of his king and queen, and Barber, who gave Bruce's grandson a glittering appraisal of his noble grandfather, my good man Blind Harry said, you know, I'm gonna let you finish, but William Wallace was one of the best heroes in Scottish history. Harry's Wallace refuses the crown three times when offered. Uh, he exemplifies kind of unselfishness, leadership, loyalty and wit, and um, these kind of traditional attributes that nobles were supposed to embody. Blind Harry's biographer sums up the portrayal of Wallace thus, quote, he goes from a young adventurer bent on taking vengeance for injuries to himself and his kinsfolk to the ruthless and dedicated leader of the national resistance movement and finally to a divinely appointed martyr to the cause of Scottish independence. By contrast, Bruce comes off less magnificently. One passage has Bruce and Wallace meeting. Wallace kind of castigates uh, Bruce for trying to make Wallace an ally of England and Edward. He says, and obviously this is in Middle Scots, um, but it says, of that false king I never waged to take, 
but contrary him with my power to make. Essentially, Blind Harry's version of Wallace drags Bruce for filth. He specifically bullies him a lot about his alliance with England. And through this, Harry is able to criticise James III for his alliance with England by kind of having Bruce uh, and James III as, it's not like a parody, but like an allegory kind of thing. Is it an allegory? Probably read my book, Book of the Duchess. Fine, well, it was allegorical. Well, we won't hold that against you. That's for each man to decide for himself. This is emphasised in another scene in the poem where Bruce kind of realises with horror that through his alliance with England, he has been destroying, quote, his own blood. Now, Harry was writing at an even greater distance from the events in question uh, than Barber, and some of the episodes in this poem are almost certainly you know, are bollocks. Regardless, these works tell us so much. You know, we can learn about the relationships between the power brokers at the Royal Scottish Court, the view of the kind of educated but non-aristocratic elite about Scotland's past and its present. Um, and we get these kind of early pre-romantic stages of mythologising the wars of independence. Scotland's referendum for independence, or at least its first one, um, took place in 2014, 700 years after Bruce's unlikely and extraordinary victory at the Battle of Bannockburn. Uh, so the impact of these sources and kind of the attitudes that they represent has reverberated down the centuries. Up there with Wallace, Bruce and Bannockburn is another source that is writ large across Scottish history. And when I say writ large, I mean writ large because if you find yourself with a spare afternoon in the beautiful city of Edinburgh, you can pop down to the National Museum of Scotland and see at least two phrases from this source emblazoned on the wall. I say at least two because the virtual tour, like the Google Maps virtual tour that you can do on the website, wouldn't let me get the full 360 angle of the bit of the exhibit that in the Kingdom of the Scots that I know, I know they're in there but you could only see two of the walls. So I think there probably is only, there's just two. But if you're there and there's three, this is, you know, this is my disclaimer. These phrases are, quote, as long as only 100 of us remain alive, we will never on any conditions be brought under English rule. And the other says, for we fight not for glory, nor riches, nor honours, but for freedom alone, which no good man gives up except with his life. This source is, of course, the Declaration of Our Birth. Signed in April of 1320, the National Museum of Scotland has a copy, not an original copy, but a copy dating from the later medieval era. And although it is a copy, it's not like the original because that was sent to its recipient, um, but it was made at the same time, so it is like 700 years old, the one that they have. Which it intended to display in 2020, the 700th anniversary of its signing, but thanks to, you know, um, that has been postponed to this summer, so you will be able to go and see it this year. The declaration is in fact a letter directed to Pope John the 22nd and endorsed by 48 different Scotsmen, mainly barons but with a few earls, and if I'm correct, Scotland didn't have any dukes at this time, so the earls were kind of the primary, the like the tip top of the nobles in the realm. The church had, two years prior, excommunicated Robert I, Robert the Bruce, um, and demanded that he appear at the papacy with a few of his bishops. He instead sent this letter, which sought to persuade the papacy to recognise and affirm Scotland's independence. It has an argument carefully designed with a specific purpose in mind and willing to use kind of all manner of rhetorical devices to achieve it. From the off, it is generous with the truth. It begins, quote, Our nation hath hitherto lived in freedom of peace with the protection of the papal see. Now, this is half true. Since the 12th century, Scotland's church had been considered a special daughter of the papacy. And I talked about that in my last video, Vague History of Scotland. Prior to 1286 and the death of Alexander III, Scotland had suffered various periods of conflict, civil and otherwise, and had since 1174 been struggling against the claims of English overlordship that had been agreed to in the Treaty of Falaise. Also see that video. The declaration is on firmer footing with its description of how this kind of present conflict broke out. 
um, basically the Edward the First took advantage of Scotland's lack of monarch to install a puppet king by way of John Balliol. Uh, the declaration then explains how Robert the Bruce triumphed through, quote, divine providence, the right of succession, and the customs and laws of the kingdom, which we will maintain till death, and the due and lawful consent and assent of the people make him our king and prince. To him we are obliged and resolved to adhere in all things, both on account of his right and merit, as the person who hath restored the people's safety in defence of their liberties. Now, call me cynical, but that's a whole lot of words to say. Listen, we know that Robert seized the throne, through kind of conflict and military might but if you could just you know overlook that that'd be great I'm being unfair Robert certainly did enjoy the quote right of succession that is mentioned twice in that paragraph he was descended from David the first of Scotland David's granddaughter Isabella of Huntingdon was Robert's great grandmother so he did have a legitimate claim to the throne and Robert certainly was motivated by a desire to oust Edward and his English agents. Um, this is portrayed by some of these sources as, you know, entirely altruistic and his kind of duty. And I'm sure he did believe that what he was doing kind of was right and was his duty. It just so happened <laughs> that what he was doing also personally benefited himself to an enormous extent. And the declaration definitely kind of leans hard on this freedom and liberties angle um, to kind of make its case. That paragraph essentially is laying out um, several justifications for Robert. And I mean, this happens anytime there is a change of regime, uh, probably in modern history as well, but certainly in kind of the medieval, late medieval, early modern, where very, you know, military might is usually what it takes to, to hold a throne or to take a throne but then you are obliged to argue uh, further, like, yes, I took this throne by conquest, but here's all the reasons that I'm I'm entitled to it anyway. Uh, so with this, obviously, they mentioned divine providence, they mentioned the right of succession, uh, but they also mentioned the due and lawful consent and assent of the people. Uh, we are obliged and resolved to adhere in all things, both on account of his right and his merit. It's kind of emphasising that the, you know, the political class uh, the very elite political class in Scotland uh, is happy with him as king and which is interesting because you know you have the divine right of kings but then you also have this idea that it's like you can't rule unless other people agree that you can rule. Oh the declaration promises two things. The nobles firstly say that if Robert goes back to siding with England he's gone, it's game over, they will be getting rid. Uh, the declaration also says that if the Pope doesn't help them out, then, quote, the Most High will lay to your charge all the blood, loss of souls, and other calamities that may ensue between us and them. So they're basically saying, if you don't help us and we stay involved in this war, that's on you. Another kind of rhetorical technique that the declaration uses is self-deprecation. It asks only that they can, quote, live in peace in that narrow spot of Scotland beyond which we have no habitation and refers to, as I said earlier, poor little Scotland to kind of emphasise themselves as victims of English oppression. As with most kind of political, religious uh, sources of this era, it brings out the old we have to stop him fighting so that we can go on crusade together. Never mind that most of them have been complete disasters. The next one's going to be great. This is something that James IV would harp on about two centuries later with absolutely zero success. Now, in terms of national myth, uh, this document, in my view, is far more exciting than, for example, the Magna Carta or, you know, the Declaration of Independence uh, for the United States, which is said to have been influenced by the Declaration of Arbroath. No matter the outcome of any future pushes for Scottish independence, the words of the Declaration of Arbroath will brace many a tea towel or fridge magnet available for purchase on the Royal Mile. But what is its historical utility as a political document of a specific moment in time with a very specific aim? Well, it shows us the arguments that Robert and his nobles thought had the best chance of persuading the Pope. They may have deliberately kind of appealed to general opinions of Scotland in Europe. Perhaps Europe tended to think of Scotland as poor and little and Scotland maybe was like trying the sympathy card a little bit. It also shows the significance of religious legitimacy. They are seeking the Pope's approval. They want religious approval 
of both their independence and their choice of monarch. The Declaration of Arbroath is probably one of the best known and most popular uh, documents in Scottish history and Robert the Bruce is almost certainly the best known and most popular figure in Scottish history but as a wise man once said there is another. I am biased by saying that St Margaret of Scotland uh, is one of the most significant figures in Scottish history but also I am right. St Margaret was the Queen Consort of Malcolm III of Scotland with whom she had eight children and three of them became kings and one of them, Edith Matilda, became the Queen of England. When Margaret died in 1093, Edith Matilda commissioned Margaret's confessor, a monk named Turgo, to write a vita, uh, which literally means life, um, and it is a sort of spiritual biography that documented the piety of an individual uh, hopefully with a mind towards canonization. I am planning to do a video on hagiography, i.e. the writing about saints, uh, at some point in the near future, so I will go into a lot more depth about that there. But in terms of Margaret, her vita worked for its intended purpose and in 1250 uh, she became a saint and her remains were translated, which basically just means moved, uh, in a ceremony overseen by her great 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 grandson, the child king Alexander III. The vita of course tells us plenty about Margaret's actual life, emphasising the importance of her dynastic heritage and taking kind of great pains to outline her descent from the pre-Norman rulers of England, the House of Wessex. But the vita also tells us about life in Scotland and life at the royal court. For example, it tells us about the town of Dunfermline as quote, naturally very fortified in itself, surrounded by a very dense forest and protected in front by steep rocks. The Vita also tells us about the rich objects and vestments uh, with which Margaret furnished the church and that Margaret brought with her to Scotland from somewhere, quote, the black cross not less feared than loved by all the people of the Scots for reverence of its holiness. The black cross sometimes known as the black rood which I think I mentioned earlier in the video but it was yesterday to me. Uh, is a remnant of the True Cross, which is the cross where Jesus was crucified. The Vita's writer, Turgo, reports how the royal children were raised, uh, which is significant information given how many uh, monarchs came out of her brood. Almost all of the Vita seems pretty plausible uh, to modern minds. It's decidedly lacking on the miracle front, but that doesn't mean we should take it at rote, and one detail exemplifies that. The writer Turgo says explicitly that Malcolm III, Margaret's husband, is illiterate. Malcolm speaks English and Latin, and his primary language seems to be Gaelic, which Margaret appears not to speak. Turgo mentions Malcolm translating for Margaret, uh, during her participation in church councils, but Malcolm cannot read. Turgo writes, quote, Wherefore the books with which Margaret was accustomed either to pray or to read, this man, although illiterate, was accustomed to leaf through by hand and to inspect, and when he had heard from her which of them was dearer, this he chose to consider more dearly and often kissed and handled. This may be true. He may have been unable to read, or at least unable to read Latin, uh, but it's also worth considering Turgo's outlook here. He was hoping to present Margaret's holiness and sanctity as worthy of canonization. To achieve this, one might seek to mould Margaret into an accepted or popular model of sanctity. What does a woman need to do in this era to be a saint? Miracles help, but Margaret only had one, and it is pitifully weak. She wanted a book brought to Dunfermline, presumably from Edinburgh or somewhere south of the river, and so she was like, bring this book to me, and the messenger was like, okay, and then he got there, and as he was fording a river, it fell out, um, it, the book fell out into the river, and then they found a layer, and it was undamaged, and that's her miracle, which I'm sorry, babes, but it's hardly water into wine, is it? Queens could well be holy. Jesus's mother Mary is often referred to in this era as the Queen of Heaven and was seen as this intermediary between humanity and God. But Mary was also a virgin and Margaret was not. There were other queens of course who ended up being considered saintly or being officially canonised but very often it was after they had been widowed and they might retire to like an abbey or convent of some kind and you know 
be religious, which obviously didn't happen with Margaret. When she died in 1093, it was uh, two, three days after the death of her husband and their eldest son. Virginity featured heavily in female hagiography of the medieval period, particularly with this model of the quote, virgin martyr. The virgin martyrs of the early Christian church are usually young, um, beautiful women who are residing in a land that is hostile to Christianity. These women are kind of tested, um, often they are threatened with marriage to a kind of pagan or heathen spouse. The women refuse and while the narratives vary they are usually executed in some very miserable manner but remain to the end true to their faith. Cheerful stuff, but very popular. But an alternative ending without the martyrdom can sometimes be found where this holy woman converts her pagan husband to Christianity. Now, Turgo has a problem. Margaret is a queen, but she's not a virgin. Uh, her death was pretty unexciting. There was no martyrdom and she never retired from uh, the royal court. Margaret's husband also was a Christian and both Scotland and England have been Christian for ages. Uh, by the time Margaret rocked up. So how can Turgo reconcile her sanctity with her lack of virginity, lack of martyrdom and her Christian husband? Well, he can portray her husband as unrefined, as savage and barbaric um, and present the church in Scotland, which was well established, as kind of unacceptably rustic and in dire need of reform. That way he can still make her story a little bit virgin martyry um, by kind of following that motif or narrative device but moulding it to her specific situation. So this might explain Turgo's emphasis on Malcolm being unable to read. The fact that he may have been doing this for an agenda doesn't mean the opposite is true. It doesn't inherently mean okay well Turgo was lying and Malcolm was literate but it shows us that Turgo perhaps had kind of a vested interest in Malcolm seeming really uncivilised and in need of an evangelising spouse. And I do wonder if, to some extent, Tago's portrayal of medieval Scotland influenced some of the later views, such as those of Jean Frossard, who I mentioned earlier, as, you know, Scotland being savage and brutal. And this is the sort of scepticism with which we need to approach these sources. Everyone has an angle, everyone has their version of events, and it is our job to interrogate the ins and outs of these. So that is my kind of whistle-stop highlights tour through some of the key documentary evidence uh, that is relied upon by historians of Scotland. I hope I've been able to explore a few of the limitations of these sources and how we might turn those limitations to our advantage and kind of squeeze out every drop that these sources have to offer. They don't always want you to do that, you know, they can be tricksy, they want you to take them at face value. And as I said earlier, you know, the trick is to know from the beginning, no source is objective, no source is unbiased. It's about figuring out as a priority what that bias is and going from there. What are your opinions on some of these sources that I have mentioned? Are there any kind of key sources that get relied upon for the writing of history in the topics that you're interested in? Please drop in the comments below. As I mentioned earlier, I am hoping to do a video on hagiography uh, in the near future. So if you have any questions about hagiography, um, if there's any saints that you find really interesting that you would like me to talk about, just drop it in the comments below. Thank you ever so much for watching and until next time.